Welcome to Purpose 360. I'm Carol Cohn, and today more than ever before, companies, brands, and their partners need to stand for something beyond the bottom line. I've created this program to provide insights and ideas to share with you so that you can apply them to your work the very next day. The goal here is to uplevel your purpose and to benefit companies and society. So please join us. I'm so excited to have Kiva.org on our show today with their new CEO, Chris Sakalakis. Kiva's mission, they were founded in 2005 to build a financially inclusive world where all people have the power to improve their lives. Chris is a veteran of Silicon Valley. He worked with eBay, he worked with StubHub, and I believe in our conversation that truly the universe was setting him up to have this role at Kiva. Kiva has a tremendous clarity of mission that you're going to hear from Chris. They are a great partner with their corporations as well as governments. They have a huge commitment to innovation. I asked Chris about, do you have an innovation department? He went, no, no, no. We practice innovation across the organization. But they also have a strategic partnerships group and impact group because they know there are over 200 partners want to know what's the great story, what's the impact that I can communicate to my constituencies. So let's get into this wonderful conversation because you're gonna learn about clarity of purpose, about there's no straight line going forward and that over communicating internally and externally is truly, truly critical to accelerate and amplify a great organization. Let's get into our conversation with Chris. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you, Carol. Thanks for having me on your on your program. Well, I am thrilled. And uh, the reason I wanted to have you on is that, you know, I'm always getting wonderful um, emails from organizations that I really follow. And I got one from Kiva and I saw the amazing uh, most current results. And so I said, got to have Chris on the show. And so I really appreciate you joining us. So, Chris, tell us a bit about your career because you're new. And how has purpose become part of your leadership strategy when you run a company? Yeah, thank you. Um, I am new. I only started about three months ago at Kiva after spending 25 years working in the e-commerce space. Uh, I started my career out of college working at Bain & Company doing strategy consulting. Uh, and I got really interested in in the internet and e-commerce in 1996. And at the time, I would tell my friends in London that I wanted to work in the e-commerce uh, industry. And they'd say, oh, yes, yes, the internet. I need to check that out. So it was, <laughs> That's great. It was, it was all very new <laughs> early, back then. Early years, sure. Yeah, but what I what I saw about the internet was that uh, the ability for technology to really improve people's lives, at the very least make people's lives easier. And I wanted to be part of that. And so I moved from London to San Francisco, uh, found my first role working for an internet startup and got very enthusiastic about how this new technology was going to change everything. Um, and my desire initially was just to be part of uh, a great internet company. Eventually, I got to eBay and I worked there 11 years. Mm. The last eight years, I, I ran. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And one of the one of the internet uh, leaders back then. Um, my last eight years at at eBay, I ran a company called StubHub. It's in uh, the world's largest online ticket marketplace. And so the focus when we were at StubHub was really to be not just the the biggest, but to be the best, the best in terms of customer service. So those are the things that that drove me. But after I left, I wanted to take that experience and, and apply it to a, an independent uh, company. And really my focus was more on financial success than on, than on purpose. And uh, I went to a startup called Vivino it's a, a wine app that 
scans wine labels. You, you use the app to, to take a photo of a wine label and you can then, the app will tell you how other people have rated the, the wine. So it, it allows you to, to choose better wines essentially. Um, and so it had kind of had really nice utility, help people pick better wines. Uh, I did that for about a year and a half. Um, very happy with what my team was able to accomplish there. But when I left, I was like, huh, you know, I have, I have this experience in the ticketing industry and in entertainment with StubHub and in the wine industry. And neither of those things really mean much to me. Um, they don't really, you know, we, as I said, at StubHub, we weren't curing cancer. They, they weren't really making a big positive social impact. They were helping people lead funner lives. Um, but not necessarily better lives. And so once I left, I started asking myself, what do I want to do next? And I still was interested in technology and leveraging uh, internet technology, but I wanted it to be tied to a greater purpose, to actually helping improve people's lives. And through that process, I started to look around and eventually was approached by a friend who's on the board at Kiva and and over time, it became very clear to me that Kiva was the solution to, to my problem. Kiva was the place where technology could be applied to improve people's lives around the world. And I really focused on that purpose. And that was the, the thing that drew me to, to the role. What, what's your favorite few parts of Kiva? The things that really attracted you? I guess number one is the international aspect of it that the impact that Kiva has is really spread across 77 countries. Over the history of Kiva uh, from 2005 until now, we've funded over $1.6 billion worth of loans in over 77 countries. So that international aspect, that idea that uh, people in this country in the United States and really around the world can provide as little as $25 to fund a loan that goes to someone in Africa or in South America uh, or in Asia, um, that, that appealed to me, that really broad international impact. Uh, the other piece of it is because it's a loan, there are a couple of interesting dynamics at play. One is when you lend money on Kiva, it's a hand up, not a handout. And so it really helps people to move forward, uh, but the money is is given back. And in fact, our historic repayment rate is 96%. That, that's extraordinary. And yeah. That's, that's great. And that repayment rate means that if you put in $100 today, over the course of the next few years, that $100 can fund $600 worth of loans because the money comes back and it can be relent. And that multiplier effect is really powerful and not something you could get just from giving a donation. So to me, those are the two most powerful parts of Kiva. So why, why don't we, for our listeners, because those of us that have used Kiva and love Kiva, we know the journey. But can you talk a little bit about, you know, what's it like if I want to do good? Um, I'm a consumer. And so tell me, what do I do? How does the website work? So the journey of a loan. If you're interested, you can come to kiva.org and you will see there a series of borrower profiles, uh, stories of individuals who are entrepreneurs, small business people in the United States and around the world who want a loan from Kiva. And that, that loan uh, is one that you can, as a lender, you can sort through and uh, decide which countries you're interested in or which uh, type of loan, agricultural, a small business, uh, that uh, like a retail shop. Uh, there are environmental loans. There are all sorts of loans that you can choose from. You read the stories of each of the, the borrowers, and then you can decide uh, whether or not to lend to that person. And you can lend as little as $25. So the loans are anywhere from a few hundred dollars to uh, to ten ten or fifteen thousand dollars, but as an individual, uh, you can give as little as twenty five dollars. The loans are are crowdfunded, um, and so once you decide on the loans you want to fund, you 
go through a checkout process the way you would on any e-commerce site and you provide your credit card. Um, we ask you if you could, if you want to give an additional donation to Kiva.org, to our, uh, our organization itself. And that's it. And you check out. And then once that happens, um, we give you, we give you an update on the loans when the loans start getting repaid. Uh, what happens with these individual borrower, borrowers in some cases? Uh, they provide updates on what's happening. And over time, as I said, 96% of these loans get repaid. The money comes back into account and you can decide what to do with them. At that point, you can decide to loan them out, uh, loan up the money out again, or you can decide to take the money back. And so, so there's this, this virtuous circle. And I've seen this happen to me. And when we worked with, with HP on their Matter to Million program, which is it, you get hooked. And, you know, you, you see how you're helping the crowdfunding model helps to accelerate it. And then you say, oh, yeah, I, I got my money back. I want to do it again. So that, that's an incredible uh, cycle of success. And you have, you have touched. I know that you have put out about $1.6 billion in loans. To how many people's lives have you touched? That $1.6 billion has funded loans to 4 million borrowers around the world. That, that's amazing. And, and then I know one of your fast facts is that you're funding loans now every two minutes. So the velocity is just, is just lovely. Um, absolutely. And also 81% of the borrowers are women. So it's a wonderful um, way to support women um, around the globe. When we look at the the universe of people we are trying to help in the world, it's 1.7 billion people. So 4 million borrowers is awesome, but we have a long way to go. Oh, and I bet under your leadership, you're going to get there very, very quickly. So Kiva has its loan program, but you've also, as the organization, has developed other impact lines, such as Kiva Capital and Kiva Labs and Kiva Protocol. So can you just explain a little bit about each one? You can start with Capital. And, you know, how were those different lines, impact lines created? Thank you for mentioning those additional impact lines. Kiva started with Kiva.org, our marketplace business in 2005. And that has been a, a sort of test bed for other ideas. Uh, the, the overall mission of Kiva, as you mentioned, is to drive financial inclusion, to increase the number of people in the world that have access to affordable financial products and, and therefore uh, have access to capital that allows them to improve their lives. Um, so something like Kiva Capital started because we saw that we had businesses interested in Kiva loans and funding those loans. And we have a program that allows them to do that, allows their employees and customers to get involved, but they wanted to make a bigger impact. And we saw an opportunity for us to create funds uh, taken from these in institutional investors uh, and foundations and to use them to give larger grants to some of our partners around the world. We have something like 200 partners that we work with around the world. And that's how uh, Kiva Capital came to bear. One of the things we're doing with Kiva Capital is we have a refugee fund. And that refugee fund has raised uh, nearly $33 million. But the idea behind the refugee fund started with Kiva.org, where we had an open question, are refugees good borrowers? Are they a good credit risk? And so we, we did a bunch of experimentation on uh, Kiva.org with refugees and found, lo and behold, yes, they're actually, the repayment rates are just as good as the rest of our borrowers. So we use that information to go back to foundations and institutions and say to them, hey, we'd like to put together this refugee investment fund. And we got a bunch of people interested, uh, including the U.S. Development Finance Corporation. So that's one of the four funds within Kiva Capital that we're doing today. So, so you're really not, you're not acting like a not-for-profit per se. I mean, you're acting like this incubator around financial inclusion. Well, I, I guess the way I think about it is as a nonprofit, what we're trying to do is fill in gaps in the market, uh, the gaps that exist because for-profit companies aren't providing them. So we think of financial inclusion as filling in those gaps, as um, finding places where the current for-profit market either provides an, in, uh, an inappropriate or 
an appropriately priced product like a payday loan, um, or they just don't provide any capital at all. Yeah. So the experimentation in our minds is is part and parcel in what we're trying to do because we're trying to fill in these gaps. Um, so we talked about Kiva Capital. Uh, Kiva Labs was also born out of this idea, like how do we innovate to to better meet the needs of our borrowers? I mean, the whole idea behind Kiva was we started as this online platform to crowdsource money from individuals and and provide microloans. The idea of a microloan existed, the idea of the internet existed, but the idea of crowdfunding loans did not exist uh, until Kiva started in 2005. So innovation really drove the whole birth of Kiva. And so these additional impact lines are ones that continue that theme of using innovation and technology to to improve financial access for for those uh, 1.7 billion people in the world who are unbanked. Uh, so getting back to Kiva Labs, ba- same basic idea. Um, when we did the experimentation around the refugees, that was part of a labs program. Um, and in five years, we used that program to provide $20 million in loans to refugees. And that's how we found out that the repayment rates were at 96%, about the same as our other group of borrowers. So I love the way that you're making this innovations lab that um, I have not heard that with many not-for-profits, that they're going to take the risk and they're going to seek to find new ways to fill the gaps. So that's great. Let's talk a little bit about Kiva Protocol. Yeah, so protocol um, is very different than what uh, we traditionally do. It's not a, it's not a strictly speaking financial services product or service. Uh, protocol is actually an identity system. It is a a digital wallet uh, and it's an ID verification system you can use with a thumbprint. And the basic idea behind it is that in order to get 1.7 billion people access to banking services, we have to make it easier for them to take care of all the identification needs that are required to open a bank account or to create credit. Um, And in most countries, that's arduous. You have to get the paperwork. It's it's kind of worked for the bank and it's worked for the individual and neither side is interested in doing it. And so what we wanted to do is create a more affordable and an easier digital solution using blockchain technology. Um, and this is a product we sell to countries. So Sierra Leone was our first customer for this. Uh, the, the country of Honduras is the second. And the third is the uh, UNHCR, the UN High Commission for Refugees. Um, and the idea here is pretty simple. They have databases of people. These countries have databases of people for, for voter registration. And so we want to take that database, digitize it, tie it to a person's thumbprint. And then when they go into a bank, they can provide that, that thumbprint to open a bank account. And they have the, the credentials they need to open a bank account. And it makes it easier for both the bank and the individual. Um, and so with the UNHCR, we hope to do that uh, within refugee camps uh, so that it's easier for transactions to happen within refugee camps. That, that's fantastic um, in, in terms of really, really filling a very, very large gap. Do you have other countries that are considering working with you besides um, Sierra Leone and Honduras? Yes, we do. We're talking to other other ones right now, but our main focus within protocol is working out all of the details within those countries. So we're still on our first 100 or 1,000 people on those systems, but we hope to have it. We hope to have millions of people uh, using Kiva protocol as their as a digital identity system, and then having other services built on top of that by by uh, other partners. It's, It's an open source system. Again, tremendous innovation. Um, Kiva has, as you said, you've got over 200 partners. And um, our listeners, many of them are either on the corporate side, the not-for-profit side. They're either contemplating a partnership or they want to make it work better. And I know that you have worked with the MasterCard Foundation uh, since 2016. Can you talk a little, little bit about what that partnership is about? And then what are the key learnings that you would like to share with our listeners, which is this is how we really make this partnership work well? 
well, as you mentioned, we, we have hundreds of partners, um, and they're in, there are different types of partners. So we have uh, microfinance institutions and other financial institutions we work with around the world. They're the ones that administer these loans. Um, they, they find the borrowers uh, for us. They provide the information on the borrowers and so forth. But our corporate partners, especially the ones in the United States, are the ones that support us through uh, philanthropy and um, what we call internally managed lending. Um, and what we do with those partners is we work with them to understand what needs they're trying to address. Uh, some have a very specific focus around impact investing. They want to invest a certain amount of dollars in order to have positive social impact. And for them, we can create um, a, a fund like the refugee fund that we created. Um, for others, they're interested in engaging their employees or their customers. Um, uh, through through a lending program. And for them, what we do is we we work with them to target the types of loans they would like to support. And then they communicate to their employees and customers. And they often put together a set amount of money, let's say $2 million that they allocate on a per person basis. So each employee gets $50 to lend on Kiva. And they can do that on behalf of the organization or the organization will match loans um, based on uh, meeting certain criteria. So if they want to invest in women in ag agriculture, they can pick those types of loans and they, those would have a, a matching program from those partners. But in, in all cases, when we work with partners, we're trying to understand their needs and how we can meet those needs through the work that we do uh, on Kiva. And how are you structured to support your partners? Because I, I know that we're always asked, um, is it a full-time FTE per XX number of partners? You know, how do you make sure you, you've got an amazing product, but that you are, to your point, Chris, you are fulfilling the um, both the business objectives as well as the social objectives of a partner? Well, we have an entire team dedicated to partnerships. It's called a, a strategic partnerships team. And the leader of that team, uh, Sarah Marshall Murray, is, is on our executive leadership team. She, she reports to me. She has deep experience on the, in the philanthropy world uh, and also, you know, earlier in her uh, career worked at the, uh, in the Peace Corps. So she has that kind of deep understanding and so does her team. And her team consists of probably 20 people. Um, and we have 144 people total at, at Kiva. So it's a, it's a pretty sizable part of the organization and they work directly with these um, these corporate partners to to be able to um, fulfill what it, what it, the the goals that they're trying to accomplish I'm sure your 20 uh, colleagues here um, are getting phenomenal stories and so how do they capture or pick the right ones and get them to their partners so their partners can amplify the great impacts of Kiva and their relationships? The borrower stories, since we we funded four million borrowers over the course of fifteen years, there there are many of them, and those are gathered through our field partners, who are primarily microfinance institutions, other financial institutions, um, and then they're brought to us. We have a an army, four hundred volunteers who translate those stories for us, and those are volunteers. Yeah, which is wonderful. They do a wonderful job. And from those, we have a, a marketing team that tries to find uh, highlights uh, that th we then put out on our social media channels. So the strategic partnerships team, they benefit from that, but most of their work is really working with our corporate partners. Can we talk a little bit about cause marketing? Um, because I know, or, or employee engagement. Because I know that when we worked with Kiva, um, it was it started out in 2013, and we were working with HP because they wanted to celebrate their 50th, and they wanted something really special, and um, it, it became it was it was a beautiful marriage because uh, HP, you know, they thought they might get 10 percent of their employees involved. We started out with a seven million dollar fund, and I think since I think up to 2018, it has generated over 21 million dollars and i know when hp split up 
you know, it's kind of like, well, who's taking the dog and who's taking the cat or whatever. And I think that both of the organizations decided they wanted to continue working with Kiva. So um, do you have any other um, stories to tell about a relationship that worked, maybe another employee engagement relationship that you're, that the organization's really excited about? Well, the thing about the HP relationship was it was our first one like that. It was a groundbreaking movement for Kiva uh, in this partnership program that we do with with corporations. So it's probably the most prominent because it's it's the Mac Daddy of them all. But I have to I have to tell you that there was no sense at the time that it was the first. Oh, really? I think that. (laughs) No, it wasn't at all. I think that I think the big surprise at HP was the amount of employee engagement and excitement. Um, and it was, it was palpable. I think everybody was surprised. So you, you were like a great, great partner. Well, thank you. That's great to hear. And I I can't take credit for it since I wasn't at Kiva in 2013, but I'll pass that on to the team. The success of that HP program created, made it a real program within Kiva, where we actively go out to corporations and say to them, would you like to engage in a program that would actually engage your customers or your employees by taking your dollars and giving them to these people so that they can lend uh, to needy people around the world. And so uh, for us, we, we've built out and, conti- and are continuing to build out tools that make it easier for corporations to work with us to target exactly who they want to target, the country, the type of borrower, um, and to and to make it more engaging for their employees or, or customers. I, I want to jump to the pandemic for the moment, um, because I know that all not-for-profits were challenged in various ways, but many of them just were actually busier um, during the pandemic. And we're still not through it, that's for sure, because you're such an innovative organization. You're so customer-focused. Can you talk a little bit about how you rose to that challenge? Yeah, so last year in 2020, we... Kiva funded $127 million worth of loans mm-hmm. and $8 million of those loans were crisis support loans that we had never done before. And those crisis support loans were specifically loans going to our partners to support them through the pandemic. In many of the countries where we have loans, there were moratoriums on loan payback. And that meant for these partners of ours, they would be in a difficult financial situation. So we wanted to support them through the pandemic. And it was something we had never done before, but credit to Kiva because we saw the need and we quickly pivoted and said, okay, we'll do this. We didn't say, hey, this isn't the type of loan we usually do. We said, our partners need us and we'll provide these loans to them. And and how did your colleagues feel? They feel great about it. I've spent the last three months at Kiva trying to talk to as many of uh, our employees as possible. And I've talked to over 50% of them now. And many of them bring up this spirit of innovation that we've created. Uh, And that one element of that innovation was moving very quickly last year to create these these crisis support loans. I I love the innovation. I love innovation, whether it's a not-for-profit or or for-profit. Let's talk a little bit about uh, your investing in U.S. small businesses. Yeah. So believe it or not, Kiva was primarily focused on loans outside the United States until about 2012, so seven years after the organization was created. And in 2012, we started a small program to see if we could lend to borrowers in the U.S. and to do it directly, as opposed to through partners, uh, as we did in the rest of the world. And initially, it was focused on starter loans, zero interest, up to $5,000, with a focus on minorities, ex-convicts, war veterans, uh, immigrants, other people who are excluded from the financial mainstream. And it's uh, specifically focused on businesses, uh, small businesses, entrepreneurs. Today, the program's evolved to the point where uh, last year we funded $8 million worth of loans just to borrowers in the United States. And we have a a whole network of hub partners. These are local organizations. Uh, Some are nonprofits, some are city governments, uh, some are um, CDFIs or community development financial, financial institutions. And they provide support to these local entrepreneurs. Uh, they also help them with the application. They make them aware of Kiva because not everyone's aware of Kiva. And we have a lot of great partners who've helped us. One, one of those is, is based here in the Bay Area 
They're called the uh, Central Community Partners, and they work with the city of Oakland, and they've supported hundreds of entrepreneurs uh, to get access to these zero interest loans. So um, what are your goals for um, expansion in the U.S. with small business? Well, we'd, we'd like to get it to be bigger than 6% of our overall uh, lending. So uh, our challenge is to expand the program and to uh, make it successful for the borrowers. Ultimately, what we care about is impact. And impact, we're trying to measure impact very simply as how much is a life improved by a Kiva loan uh, or, or a set of lives. We, we hope it's not just one life that's improved. And so that's what we're trying to do. We'd like to expand the the network of hub partners that we have because we think that's beneficial uh, to us. Uh, but we're still trying to find the, the best way to scale out that program. And you talked about impact. And obviously, any of your partners are going to require what is the impact? You know, besides the dollars and loans, which is great, the repayment rate is extraordinary. But I love you. You talked about the impact on a life or a set of lives. So I'm sure you're feeling what that means at Kiva, but what would you like to give to, if it's a MasterCard, for example, or another partner in terms of, you know, because they need it for their social impact report, of course. It's a little tricky to do it really well. Uh, I think we have a great impact team that measures impact for us. And so we look at things like, what is the situation of the borrower before the loan? As, as you might imagine, those people who have less income, who have less access to capital, they have more to gain from a loan than someone perhaps who's uh, in the upper middle class, as an example. Uh, and so we're trying to measure what the impact is of each of our loans. And we give each loan a score from one to 10. Um, and so we use this internally. We're trying to figure out how to show this externally but we put each of our loans into one, uh, one of three buckets in terms of impact. And the overall impact is somewhere around a seven, not a 10. So we're trying to focus on, okay, how do we continue to have that level, level of impact or higher, but at a higher dollar amount? That's kind of the trick of the whole thing. Because we could, we could fund many more loans, but to people who needed it less, because that would be easier to do. Uh, so we, we want to be able to grow the dollars while still maintaining or improving the impact that we have. So it sounds like you you like to, you don't do easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, again, you know, we, we exist, we exist to fill market gaps. And right. I feel like the for-profit market does easy. So yeah, we don't do easy. That's why you need innovation. There you need you innovation love it. <laughs> to do the difficult stuff, to do the stuff that other people have said, like, eh, this isn't this isn't going to work, or I'm not going to be able to make money on this. Well, to our uh, listeners, you're not you're not seeing Chris, but he is like smiling. He's like getting so into it because he loves we don't do easy, and he really wants. I can see why you've been um, attracted to Kiva, and that you're going to take so many of your decades of experience and really ex accelerate um, the continued growth of the organization. I I'd love to have you share with our listeners. And so let's just talk about two different types of listeners. We're going to talk about the corporate listeners. Can I want to hear you make a pitch to them in terms of why they should partner with Kiva. Okay. Well, thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> I would say to any corporation out there, if they're trying to do something to improve their social impact, Kiva is a perfect solution for them. It's also a perfect solution if they're trying to increase the engagement of their employees or customer base around social impact. And the way we do it at Kiva is we allow them to take their dollars to specifically decide where they go, what type of people they want to support in what countries. And then a mechanism that allows their customers or employees to take those dollars and vote on a person by person basis. Who do they want to support? Beyond that, the money that you put forward, the money that the corporation puts forward is then multiplied over the course of three years is typically how we do it. So instead of just giving a donation of $2 million, you can put in $2 million and over the course of three years, that $2 million can fund something like $6 million worth of loans. And so the impact that you have is outsized relative to what it would be if it were a donation. How about to a country government 
that may be using Kiva protocol. For any government who's considering digital identity, Kiva protocol is a solution. Many have been asked to provide a digital identity system, but it's easier said than done. Kiva protocol as a product of our nonprofit is an open source system built with the newest technology, and it doesn't tie you to one big vendor for multiple years. Uh, we don't, right now we're not charging for it. So it's free. That's one pitch, one part of the pitch. But the idea is really simple. We're creating an open source technology platform. We will work with you to implement that platform. And we are, we will build a partner system so that services can be built on top of it. You have this incredible, you've got, you know, your impact team, and then you've got your partner team, and then you've got your innovations team. What have you learned early on regarding the organization, the departments, the groups? You've got, you said about almost 150 people that's truly been igniting the future growth of Kiva and its success. One thing I'd like to say initially is really a correction. We don't have an innovation team. There isn't one team tasked with innovation. Innovation is really the responsibility of everyone. Everyone. So I love that. It's a great key learning. So thank, thank you for that. Yeah. So we have an engineering team with people who have expertise in building out software. Uh, we have a product team with, that has expertise about building out customer interactions and how we want those to work both at the, uh, on our website and at the protocol uh, level. So we do have different groups that do different things, but they're all focused on innovation. The one unifier for Kiva, and I think this is true for a lot of nonprofits, is our mission. This is the thing that I heard most consistently in the 87 employee interviews that I've done. The reason that people are at Kiva is because of the mission. And because of that, because of their dedication to financial inclusion, everyone they work with at Kiva is collaborative. They want to solve a problem. They want to make an impact. They want to further that mission. And that spirit of believing in the mission and moving it forward allows us to be innovative, to be creative, to be collaborative. I think that's the number one piece. It's certainly the number one thing that when I, if, when I ask Evans what works well at the, com- at the company, that's the, that's the number one thing they bring up. But I think you have a special sauce because we've worked with lots of not-for-profits. And um, there's something very magical about, it looks like you're all rowing in the same, you know, you've got to get Cox in, you're rowing, you've just won your gold in the Olympics, where, you know, we just passed the Olympics. Um, There's something special. Do you know what that is? Any organization that's rowing in the same direction, that is due to leadership. And I say that not as a brag, because I've only been here three months. It's really due to the leadership that preceded me. Um, And so it it is being clear about where we want the organization to go and being steadfast and going after it and being consistent. And so this idea of financial inclusion uh, and broadening financial inclusion, that's what has driven, that's what drove Kiva.org in the first place, the Kiva marketplace. That's what drove the creation of Kiva Capital and Kiva Protocol. So I think when you have an organization that says, yeah, we want to do this thing, we're going to be innovative, and they actually do it, they move forward, people get energized by that. So you haven't been there that long, but I want to ask you, what's What's a favorite day? What's a great day at Kiva? A great day for me is being able to connect with my colleagues, with employees across the organization, getting their perspectives on what's working, what's not working, and figuring out ways we can move forward. Um, We had, I think I mentioned, we had this strategy offsite we did two weeks ago with the leadership team at Kiva, and it was very energizing to be in the same room with colleagues after so long. But what was very energizing about it was really defining what we wanted to do next. And not so much harping on all the things that are wrong with the current organization or what we need to fix, but focusing on what we want to do next and how we can increase the impact that we have on the world, the positive impact that we have on the world. Um, So part of that work was saying, yeah, we we exist because to fill these market failures, to fill in the gaps in the financial service business. And if that's the case, what else can we do? How do we use technology, 
and our partnerships, which have always driven Kiva. How do we use those two assets to further the work that we're already doing and to expand into other areas, other areas of financial services? And that is a very thought provoking and energizing question. And we have some ideas about it, but I don't want to, I don't want to give away any secrets right now. Okay. But, but then let me ask you, um, let's just go forward. And a year from now, I'm going to check in with you and I'm going to say, can you tell me a little bit about what your vision is for maybe the next year for Kiva? Yes. For me right now, we're focused on defining what we want to do for the next five years and defining how much we put into our existing initiatives and how much we put into new initiatives. I think it's very likely there'll be new financial service products that we create in order to expand our impact. Our ambition is really to increase the loan value and the uh, the amount of financial services we, we put out there. We want to increase that by at least 5x in the next five years. I wanted you to just tell a little story about your family background, um, because I think that there's a, maybe there's a little bit of the energy that's in you that's about your dad, and he was an immigrant, and that there's a, a sense of that you have a feeling and understanding growing up of what financial inclusion and a gap might be. Yeah, thank you for asking about that. Um, as you mentioned, my parents are immigrants. They, they came from Greece, the United States shortly before I was born. And they came to a country that was alien to them. They didn't speak English. Um, they had some family here, but that was about it. My father had a business in Greece. He had a, a store in Athens and he was an electrical contractor. But when he moved to the United States, his qualification as an electrical contractor in Greece meant nothing. So he had to start all over. He, first, he was a laborer. Then he eventually found an apprenticeship working for an electrical contractor in Chicago, and eventually he became a journeyman. And then seven years after he moved to the U.S., he started his own business, his own electrical contracting firm. And part of his ability to do that started with a line of credit from a bank, from uh, a local bank. We, I grew up in the suburb of Chicago called Bridgeview. So Bridgeview Bank provided that line of credit. And over the years, my dad really wanted to be successful and expand beyond just being an electrical contractor. So beyond having his own business and having a few employees working for him, he took the money that he made and started investing it in real estate and doing small real estate development, small kind of strip centers. Uh, and he needed to get money to do those transactions too, to buy the land, to build out the, the building. And he, and he got that through loans, again, mostly through Bridgeview Bank. So he had a relationship with a local banker who knew him who didn't judge him because he spoke broken English and he repaid those loans and was able to go back again and again and build his business that way. And, and this helped to fund you and your, your siblings to go to college. Yeah, that's right. So because of my, my dad's business, the electric construction business, real estate development business, my, my brothers and I were the first in our family to go to college. My, my parents didn't graduate from high school, so we were the first to graduate high school too. That access to capital meant everything for our family. And once I started to more fully understand Kiva, I saw that connection between what Kiva does, uh, giving people around the world access to capital and my own story. And that maybe gives you a little bit of that extra heart. I know you got a lot of heart, but it's, it, I think it's fascinating. This is almost like this job was the job that you were meant to do. Yeah, I, I came to the conclusion last summer that I really wanted to focus on a business that had great people and great purpose. And it was only a few months later that I, uh, that I heard from Andre Haddad on, our, on the Kiva board about Kiva. And then I started putting two and two together. So sometimes when you know what you want and it shows up right in front of you, you know how to, you know to grab it and move forward with it. And that's what happened with Kiva for me. And the the universe was just setting you up over time to truly to truly come back to your roots. So I love that story, and I love that it's so personal to you. And you're bringing all of your experience together uh, to truly, you know, I know that a year from now you're going to say, "Oh, 
five times, you know, we're eight times, you know, <laughs> that multiplier effect. So is there anything else that you'd like to share? I'd love you to share three insights for our listeners that um, they could be for profits, they could be for not for profits. But in terms of success, you know, yes, you've only been there some months, but here's an organization that you're going to now take to the next level. So perhaps any core insights you can share so that anyone listening is going to say, yeah, that, that can apply to me either side of the equation that I'm on. Well, the first insight I'd give is that you need to be dedicated to a mission. You need to be clear about your what your overall goal is. Our mission of financial inclusion is very broad and it's one we keep striving towards. And it's one that maybe we'll never achieve in terms of financial inclusion for all, given that there are 1.7 billion people who are unbanked in the world. But it's one that inspires all of us and and gives us a gives us a North Star to to pursue. Once you have that, the next stage of it is to define what part of the universe you're going after. Um, So so you have a general direction with the North Star, but you still have to pick a path to take to get to it. And that path is not a straight line. That path will change over time. And I, I bring that up because we started with the marketplace and we still think the marketplace of matching individual lenders to individual borrowers has a lot of legs to it. But we we realized that we weren't going to get as far as we wanted to on this path unless we started adding to it. And that's why we added Kiva Capital and Kiva Protocol. And at each point along the path, you may take a slightly different path. And it may be you go down that path and it's a dead end. It goes nowhere. Sometimes you have to go backwards to go forwards. And and by by that, I mean, you have to try a bunch of things and see whether or not they get the impact you want, whether or not they they get you closer to the goal or not closer to the goal. And if they don't, then you have to stop them and do something else. True and testing and learning. For exactly. Sure. Yeah. And exactly. so that's that's a very well-known concept within the technology world, within Silicon Valley. I don't know how well-known it is within the nonprofit world, but it does mean that you are willing to fail and you try things that are maybe crazy. Uh, some would argue Kiva Protocol is kind of crazy. It's out there. It's very different than what we do today, but we feel like if it, if it's successful, it really furthers our mission of financial inclusion. So that's why it's worth trying. And we're willing to say in a couple of years, yeah, it didn't work out exactly the way we wanted, but we learned a lot from it, even if it doesn't work out. Very Silicon Valley. I love that. And what's the third one, your third insight? The third one is with, within any organization, Communication is the number one key. Communicating internally and externally, being really clear about where you want your organization to go and how you're going about getting there. And I say that it seems obvious, but I find over and over again, when I start talking about things at Kiva, people thank me for my transparency. And I'm thinking, well, this is obvious, isn't it? And it's not. So for any leader, uh, I would pass on the the lesson that I learned, the things that are in your head, the things that you see in terms of where the organization is going, uh, if they're obvious to you, it doesn't mean they're obvious to other people. So being really clear about where you're going and how you get there, uh, again, both internally and externally is is super important if you want people to come along with you for the ride. So Chris, this has been, it has absolutely exceeded my expectations. I know you're new and I know that you're a little, I don't know if I can like answer all of these, but I think that you are the absolute leader for this organization at a time where there are so many, to your point, over a a billion seven, right? 1.7 billion unbanked. You've got a large gap to fill. So I, I I trust that you have found your true life's calling and that you're going to take all of your experiences and apply it to Kiva. And so that when we talk and we'll talk in a year or so, you're going to go, yeah, we've got that acceleration idea going. We're really going to get to that billion. So I know you will. Well, Carol, thank you so much for your kind words and for this opportunity to speak with you and to speak about Kiva. To anyone who's listened through this whole podcast, I really appreciate your spending the time. You had so many great gems. I love your three insights. And so I will always end with the statement uh, that is, what is the power of your purpose? 